By the end of summer 1944, American forces were well established in the Marianas, only 1,500 miles from Tokyo. In the southwest Pacific, U.S. Army troops had swept to the western tip of New Guinea. But further progress from both of those newly won positions demanded the securing of the flank. Between western New Guinea and the Marianas lay a small group of islands in the Carolines called Palau. To the top strategists of the Pacific War, the problem was, must heavily defended Palau be taken? In the late summer of 1944, the Allied advance in the Western Pacific pointed to a quickening schedule of invasions. Morotai and the Halmahera group was an obvious target on the drive from New Guinea. On the right flank of that route lay Palau. The necessity for the invasion of the Palau Islands was discussed by the top Army and Navy commanders in the Pacific at great length. General MacArthur, intent on retaking the Philippines, felt that Palau must be seized to secure his right flank and also to provide a base from which air cover could be furnished for the Philippine operation. Admiral Nimitz agreed. Admiral Halsey, on the other hand, felt that the Palau campaign was not really necessary. During September, Halsey's third fleet was on the prowl in the waters off the southern Philippines and launched its planes in attacks against enemy airfields on those islands. The carrier plane's attacks were highly successful. Because of the light opposition to these carrier raids on the Philippines, Halsey recommended that Palau be bypassed, a recommendation which was not followed by his superiors. At home in the late summer of 1944, America was demonstrating that she was fully capable of waging warfare successfully against the enemies in Europe and in Asia. Less than three years after Pearl Harbor, U.S. industry was achieving miracles in producing the machines and weapons of war in unbelievable quantities. America was geared completely to the demands of the two-ocean war. Supply troops on both sides of the world was the nation's number one business. By the late summer of 44, America's millions had adjusted with good grace to the inconveniences and shortages of wartime living. America was solidly behind the two wars being fought on far-flung battlefields. On Main Street and on Broadway, U.S. citizens were investing in that war. To shorten the time needed to win that war, the people, young and old, directed all their energies toward one goal the backing up of American fighting men. Of course, everybody had to relax once in a while, especially the servicemen just back from the front. And there was a good deal to be happy about. Paris had been liberated, and Patton was racing across France. Most Americans felt it wouldn't be too long before the Nazis were knocked out of the war. Then the U.S. could rarely go to work on Japan. Mounting confidence was evident all over the United States. But there were constant reminders, too, that the war wasn't quite won, that there were still costly battles to be fought. In the Western Pacific in early September 1944, the war was being carried forward toward eventual final victory by the powerful amphibious forces which were driving deeper into the enemy's zone of defense. The immediate objective was the group of islands called Palau. To seize the most strategically important islands in that chain, a force of sizable proportions was dispatched, assigned to bombard and invade the designated target islands in mid-September. The decision on which islands of the group to invade was a difficult one. The largest number of Japanese troops was concentrated on Babel Tuop, the largest island. Less than half as many enemy troops garrisoned Pelalu, which also had an airstrip. A relatively small force defended Angaur, which was in a commanding position at the base of the Palau chain. The amphibious force which moved northwestward through the far Pacific was to strike at the last two of those islands, 
Pelleleu and Angaur. The naval and troop commanders checked over the planned invasions for the last time. On September 15, 1944, the assault was begun on Peleliu Island by the men of the 1st Marine Division. The last pre-invasion airstrikes were made, concluding three days of softening up enemy strong points by strafing and bombing. Peleliu was to be invaded and captured so that U.S. forces would gain possession of the vitally important airfield on the island, a key to the control of the Western Pacific area. Before the assault troops stormed ashore on Peleliu, the approaches to the beach were prepared for the first waves of boats. This delicate and hazardous job fell to the underwater demolition teams, composed of selected Navy and Marine volunteers, popularly known as frogmen. The underwater demolition men had to be able to swim long distances underwater and to work well completely on their own. The frogmen had to work quickly, first in locating the obstacle to be removed, natural or artificial, and then to set the high explosive charge correctly under the most difficult conditions. Then the trick was to get back to the pickup boat without being spotted by the enemy. Once safely out of the immediate area, the job was completed. During the latter years of World War II, the frogmen enabled many invasions to go off smoothly. Early on D-Day morning, the Navy's warships sought to soften up the beaches by the final pre-invasion bombardment. Though the battle on shore was expected to be another Tarawa, the Navy complained that they had run out of targets. But there were many installations which the Navy's guns did not even touch. As H hour neared, the combat information center aboard ship became the nerve center of the operation. At 6.30 on D-Day morning, the amphibian tractors carrying their complement of assault troops started for the line of departure, the area from which the final dash to the beach would be begun. The landing craft, each one a part of a designated wave, rendezvoused before making the coordinated move toward the beaches. In the Palalu invasion, each step of the operation by each unit was reported to the top commanders on the command ship. They were thus able to gain an overall picture of the situation. Wave one for final line of departure at 0825. On deck, the troop commanders watched anxiously as the landing craft moved toward the beaches. The assault troops were preceded by a rocket barrage directed against the area behind the landing beaches. Resistance on Peleliu was expected to be heavy. As the armored amphibians moved toward shore, they drew heavy fire from the enemy, a good indication of what was in store on the beaches. As the landing craft neared the shore, the atmosphere aboard the command ship became charged with tension. Each message received from the assault units helped fill in a vital part of the broad mosaic of the battle for the beachhead. This was the first amphibious assault made by the 1st Marine Division to be opposed by the enemy. The landings at Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester, New Britain, had been nothing like this. In the Marine Corps, the 1st Division had earned the reputation of drawing operations which entailed easy landings. But at Peleliu, this tradition of good luck was dissipated. The first waves hit the beach to the accompaniment of intense enemy mortar and artillery fire. The prediction that it would be rough turned out to be an understatement. Casualties on the beaches were heavy. The 1st Marine Division was paying dearly for the small strip of coral and sand along Peleliu's western shore. To hold on to the slim foothold, the Marines had to drive quickly inland to deepen their beachhead. In the face of withering enemy fire, they pushed ahead. flank 
the battle was particularly tough. The 3rd Battalion of the 1st Marine Regiment ran into very heavy opposition. A brutal fight developed. On D-Day on Peleliu, the situation reports on the fierce and confused fighting were relayed regularly to the top command. The line against the enemy was broken by two major gaps, so serious that the position of the entire U.S. force on the island was endangered. Fire one. We are under heavy infilade fire. The critical situation was followed with careful attention to every minute detail by the commanders of the operation on the command ship offshore. On the afternoon of D-Day on Peleliu, the Marines found themselves faced with the necessity of stopping a strong enemy counterattack. The men of the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, braced themselves for the attack. At 4.50 o'clock, the Marines opened up with everything they had. In the savage battle, American tanks once again took the measure of the obsolete Japanese models. The enemy counterattack failed completely and ended in a familiar way. The first objective for which the Marines were fighting so bitterly was the airfield on Peleliu. To seize that airstrip, the exhausted Marines pushed on in a determined effort to gain that prize before nightfall. By the late afternoon, the Marines had possession of part of that objective. But the conquest of Peleliu wasn't to be as brief as originally planned. The biggest obstacle to the Marines' progress was Bloody Nose Ridge. Holed up inside many of the peaks in that ridge, the Japanese troops could exist for a long period, could enter and leave by any one of a number of passages. It was up to the Marines to clean the enemy out of every cave entrance, and they attacked the job with great determination. to take Bloody Nose Ridge on Peleliu was one of the toughest spot actions of the entire Pacific War. Casualties in the lines were taken back to a more protected area, but sometimes that job was almost impossible. Many of the casualties were taken to a safer position behind the front, right under the sights of the enemy's guns. During the first two days, one company alone suffered 67% casualties. It became apparent that this was to be no quick operation. As often as possible, badly wounded Marines were taken off the island entirely, out of range of the enemy's fire. During many of the Pacific campaigns, the wounded American serviceman was transferred quickly to a waiting hospital ship standing by offshore. Often, the entire trip from the front lines to the sanctuary of the ship's hospital took less than an hour. Many of the difficult surgical cases would not have been saved in former wars. Indeed, the advances made in medical science during World War II helped keep U.S. casualties at a minimum. Thanks directly to the efficient work of the Army and Navy doctors, and the nurse corps, the lives of thousands of American fighting men were saved. The invasion of Angaur was made by the Army's 81st Division on September 17th, two days after the assault on Peleliu. The 81st, nicknamed the Wildcat Division, was commanded by General Paul Mueller, who led his troops into combat for the first time on Angaur. After the customary softening up of the beaches, the men of the 81st landed against light resistance and went about the job of seizing the island from the enemy garrison force. Angaur was not heavily defended, 
but the enemy had to be wiped out yard by yard. The GIs on Angaur suffered some casualties too, but fortunately not a high percentage of the troops committed. The frontline work of the army medics under fire was notable. For four days, the GIs pressed the attack on Angaur. On September 20th, all organized resistance ceased. The enemy's defense of Angaur had crumbled. The island was declared officially secure on that fourth day. Without any loss of time, army engineers went to work on the construction of an airstrip on the island. The work of clearing the area was carried forward under enemy sniper fire. The field on Angaur would provide a second bomber strip in the Palau's and would lessen the amount of traffic on the Palau strip. Construction was continued even after dark. The GI in charge of the lights which flooded the area was ready to pull the switch in a second if an alert was sounded. On Pelaliu, the Marines were having a tougher time dealing with the enemy in the caves of Bloody Nose Ridge, a fortress which was proving virtually impregnable to the Marines' continuing attacks. Progress was slow. The Marines advanced slightly, only to be stopped after each small gain. Sometimes the Marines would be thrown back from their newly won position. The call for air support was quickly answered. The men on the ground took a short breather while Marine pilots went to work on the enemy. The crescendo of the howitzers prefaced each new attack. Some areas of Bloody Nose Ridge were fought for several times. On Pelaliu, advances were often measured in terms of a few yards. Once in a great while, the Marines gave their weapons a short rest. The Navy hospital corpsmen had plenty to do. Casualties were mounting at an alarming rate. General William Rupertus felt that his 1st Marine Division could carry on without help. But his superior, 3rd Amphibious Corps Commander Marine General Roy Geiger, felt that it would be wise to bring in, as reinforcement, a regimental combat team from the Army's 81st Division relatively fresh after the short struggle on Angaur. The GIs of the 321st Infantry Regiment were to relieve a badly chewed up Marine Regiment, the first, which had been clawing at the enemy at Bloody Nose Ridge for eight straight days. The soldiers were to work with elements of the 7th Marine Regiment in the drive north to secure the northern section of Palaliu. The Army troops edged around the ridge and approached it from the north in a move coordinated with marine attacks from the sides of the ridge. Some of the marines were assisted by war dogs who were trained to detect the enemy's presence. The fight for Bloody Nose raged on. From the airfield on Peleliu, marine pilots took off on the shortest bomb run in World War II in the Pacific, 1,000 yards to the target. Bloody Nose Ridge, more formally called Umabrogal Mountain. Sometimes the planes dropped napalm-filled belly tanks with instantaneous fuse mechanisms. The results were most effective. Napalm, which had first been used against the enemy on Tinian, often proved more devastating than regular bombs particularly on jagged terrain. Week after week, U.S. troops assaulted Bloody Nose Ridge with every weapon available.
favorite weapon of Japanese soldiers on suicide missions was the Bangalore torpedo. While the campaign on Palalu was continuing, it became apparent that a supplementary operation would have to be conducted against an adjoining island, Ngesavus, which was given a once-over by the marine pilots. On September 28th, Marines of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, conducted a well-executed shore-to-shore operation from Peleliu to Ngesavus. This small-scale invasion was necessary to deny the enemy the use of a base for his artillery, which was being directed against U.S. troops on Peleliu. Ngesavus was seized without too much difficulty by the 1,000th Marines. The island was taken quickly, and U.S. losses were light. On Palaliu, the fight for Bloody Nose continued without let-up. By the end of September, the enemy was losing control of the island. A number of Japanese soldiers surrendered but they represented only a part of the force still alive on Peleliu. For every enemy soldier who gave himself up, there were many more still holed up in the caves of Bloody Nose Ridge. On Peleliu, a handful of Japanese troops were taken alive before the island was turned secure. As for the rest, the U.S. forces spent another eight weeks sealing up cave entrances in the last pocket of enemy resistance an area about 900 yards long and 400 yards wide. By late November, the enemy was all finished on Palaliu. In taking two key islands in the Palaus, U.S. fighting men had seized a valuable area in the far reaches of the western Pacific. The stars and stripes flew over the most westerly of the Carolyn Islands after a campaign which ranked with the most bitterly fought of the war in the Pacific. From that territory, won at a cost of more than 1,600 American lives, U.S. forces were in position for their next move. In October, a sizable airstrip capable of accommodating heavy bombers was in operation on Angaur. From that field, U.S. bomber pilots made periodic runs over some of the islands in the Palau group which had not been invaded by American amphibious forces. The pilots concentrated on enemy positions on Babeltuap and Koror. Occasionally, these routine missions proved fatal. But gradually, the air over the Western Pacific came under U.S. control. With Moratai in the Moluccas functioning as one air base and the Palaus as another, U.S. planes could easily cover the forthcoming invasion of the Philippines. Starting in October, U.S. bombers operating from Palau attacked Japanese fields and installations in the Philippines. And just one month after D-Day at Palau, U.S. invasion forces were en route to the long-awaited invasion of the Philippine Islands. 